Welcome to Monday Morning Critic Podcast. Here is Derek Thomas. Don't start what you can't finish. You're going with me or without me? I saw exactly what I've always felt about Donnie Wee Boy. And I saw that girl can't protect her child. Margaret Jimmy is her boy. He's your grandson. We're trying to locate a Donnie Wee Boy. He married our son's widow. Got our grandson with him. You let it be known you're looking for a wee boy. I'll find you. We thought we'd see Jimmy. Since we're in the neighborhood. Since you're in the neighborhood. Go careful. Where in the hell are we? We came to see our grandson. My boy doesn't have to answer to you. And we don't have to answer to you. Oh. <laughs> Come with us. No. He'd kill me. Him and his mother. Your grandson. He's a wee boy now. You're with me on this, right? We're right behind you. He hit Lorna. You hit your wife. Like. Don't start what you can't finish. Welcome to Monday Morning Critic Podcast. I am Derek Thomas. This is episode 208. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's guest is author Larry Watson. Uh, Larry Watson's book, Let Him Go, was made into the Kevin Costner slash Diane Lane led movie by the same name, Let Him Go. And I had seen the trailer for Let Him Go a multitude of times. And I was just hook, line, and sinker. I I wanted to see it. And many times when I have guests, I get screeners sent to me by the movie company. Um, This time, that just wasn't the case. So I knew if if I was going to see it, I would have to go to the movie theater. And I have enough anxiety with COVID to begin with. Um, but But I said, you know, the last time I was at the theater was right around Thanksgiving. So about a year. Um, the last movie I saw at the theater before Let Him Go was uh, Welcome to the Neighborhood, um, Tom Hanks playing Mr. Rogers, another phenomenal movie. But it had been a long time, and just a little bit of a backstory, I might have said this on prior episodes, um, the movie theater was my church, the movie theater was my cathedral. Every Saturday morning I was at the first show, I was at the matinee, um, I want to say for 25 years, maybe, maybe more. And it's where I found solace. It's where I found just inner peace. Not to be cheesy or, 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 or just over the top, but it's truth. I mean, at the movie theater for me is is where I find, you know, it's where I have that time to myself to really just process things and just get away from the world. I mean, it is, it is my visual bottle of scotch. It is my visual bottle of beer. I just... I just love feeling the way I do after a movie, especially one like Let Him Go that I absolutely love. Um, So it was, this is special for me for a variety of reasons. It marked my return to the movie theater after a year, which is a big deal, maybe not to you, but certainly to me. Um, I knew I was having Larry on the show. We had booked it before I went to the theater, so I was excited for that. So there's so much going on here, and I was just, you know, I was really looking forward to it, you know. You miss the little things, you know. I think of Kevin Costner, um, maybe it wasn't Costner, no, it was Ray Liotta in Field of Dreams where he's talking about what he missed most about baseball. And he's he's talking about the smell of the grass and he's talking about these little intangibles that you would never think of 
Well, I got to tell you, for me, it was the same going to the movie theater, right? It's the smell of the popcorn. It's the smell of um, pretzels being cooked. It's the Diet Coke that I love to have and stuffing my face with a medium popcorn. Man, those are the little things I miss so much. Never mind getting blown away by a movie uh, of the caliber caliber of Let Em Go. So I was just so happy and so thrilled. And, you know, this to me is why podcasting is just so special. I, I can come on here and pour my heart out and just... Uh, um, I hope it means something to you. I hope the the, the passion of, of movies in the theater, I hope that resonates a little bit with many of you. Um, not to knock Netflix. I just finished Queen's Gambit. I have, I'm in talks with a lot of guests for that. But blown away by it, right? But, but honestly, there's only so many Netflix shows or Hulu or small stuff on the small screen that you can watch. Like if I had to watch Netflix for the rest of my life, I wouldn't be miserable. I'd be a happy guy. But there's something very special about the movie theater, right? The smell of the grass, the smell of the popcorn. There's something very unique and very beautiful about that. And I don't know, I was just blown away and just very excited to be back at the theater. This is an absolutely wonderful movie. There's something about Kevin Costner in Westerns, right? Open range, you can go on and on. He's just so good. But this movie, he's so vulnerable. And that's all I'll say. This movie does contain spoilers towards the end, so just be careful, tread lightly. Um... Diane Lane, amazing cast. And, and my, my guest, Larry Watson, I am so embarrassed that it took me this long to find this man. Like, he is a critically acclaimed author. And the funny thing is, we were going back and forth. He goes, well, why do you want to interview me? I almost felt like saying, well, why do you want to be on my podcast? Like, I mean, I've been having the most wonderful conversations with people that are either authors or actors or directors, cinematographers, writers. Just, it's just been so much fun for me. Like, if this is the ride from here on out, I'm buckling up. I'm so excited. I'm so thrilled. I am so passionate about this. I just love it. And I love the fact that you're listening. You're giving me an opportunity to take up an hour of your time. Um, you're going to love this interview. Larry Watson, he was a professor. He's an author. Just a really talented, really gifted writer. Um, wonderful author. Um, hope you love the interview. Before I send you off to the interview, uh, please, uh, if you want to reach out, Follow me on Monday Morning Critic Podcast on Facebook, MDM Critic on Twitter, Monday Morning Critic Podcast on Instagram. If you want to leave a review, which I would absolutely love, on Apple Podcasts, it's Monday Morning Critic Podcast. I would appreciate a, a, a review. And you can also go to my website, mmcpodcast.com. I have interviews on the main page. And if you go up top to the header, you can see past episodes with some, some pretty special guests as well. So I think you would like that. I think it's worth a listen. Um, I might be a little biased, but I certainly believe that. Um, you want to reach out, send me an email. It is mondaymorningcritic at gmail.com. If you have been reaching out, thank you for that emails, those emails that you're sending. I really appreciate that. Let's not waste any more time. Please welcome author Larry Watson. My next guest is an author whose works include Montana 1948, Justice, White Crosses, and the currently in theaters absolutely stunning Let Him Go, and I am so embarrassed it's taking me this long to discover him. He is so talented. Please welcome Larry Watson. Larry, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, you're very welcome. Good to be here. Yeah, and it's, you know, I look at your life and there's so much to it. You know, I, I see the love you have for the West. I see the love you have specifically for North Dakota, for those listening. Um, you know, you're born there, educated there, you know, married high school sweetheart. Larry, is there something, and those things are all huge events in, in, in one's life, is there something deeper than that, that that resonates with you? I mean, all of those things are clearly important life milestones, right? Is there something deeper for you in, in North Dakota? Uh, sure. It's where I'm from. You know, I've, I've lived other places longer than I lived in North Dakota, but um, it's still the terrain that seems most familiar to me. Um, I'll, I'll always be a North Dakota guy, a Northern Plains person. Um, you, you know, I, I was born in Rugby, North Dakota, which, as you know, is the geographical center of North America. Mm. And um, But grew up in Bismarck. I'll never know another community the way I knew the way I knew Bismarck. And um, so, no, it's just it's just uh, uh, part of who I am. And, and have you gone back, Larry? I know you said you spent m much of your life out of North Dakota, but do you find yourself going back or is it, have you not been back? Uh, it used to be that we would be back 
probably at least once a year. Um, and we still have family back there. Uh, it's been a couple of years now. Um, you know, things happen. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, sure, we, we go back regularly. You know, and, and I was reading a little bit, and I hope I have this right, that um, one of your parents was an attorney, the other involved in the oil industry. Do I have that right, Larry? You're correct. Um, how were they, when you showed promise and a love for writing, um, I, I'm assuming, and, I, and this is an assumption because I, I definitely didn't research this, that you, you've loved writing for some time. Um, how, what was your parents' reaction to that? Were they very supportive of you wanting to write? Were they... How did it unfold? For, how did your passion kind of, and I'm assuming it's a passion, unfold for you um, as you grew up and, and became older and your parents' reaction to it? Well, it it didn't really, at least I didn't think it revealed itself until I was in college. And that just had to do mostly with what uh, school was like back then. We just didn't write in in school. You know, I mean, it, in in high school, it was... Uh, grammar one semester and literature the next, and I didn't do particularly well in in either course. Uh, I, I had always been a reader. I liked to read. Uh, but it wasn't until I got to college and I took uh, an advanced composition course. And we had a young teacher. It was the 60s. She sort of let us do our own thing. And I, without much to go on, I decided my thing was going to be poetry. I think I probably thought it was going to be easy and hmm. maybe I'd come under the influence of, of some modernist poets who seemed to just sort of splatter words all over the page. And I thought, what the hell, I can do that. <laughs> and um, the the poems weren't good at all. I mean, they were terrible. <laughs> Why mm. wouldn't they? I, I had no ex real experience in the art, but it felt good to make them. I mean, I, it, and, and in some strange way, it sort of connected back to my childhood, to play, to, to coloring and drawing and carving and, uh, and, and making, making things. And so it wasn't long after that, that I, I decided I wanted to have a life or wanted to try to have a life that had uh, writing at the heart of it. Uh, I'd started college as pre-law and, and only because I had to say something. And as you mentioned, my father was an attorney, so I knew that was something that people could do. And, uh, but I soon switched to being an English major and, and planned to take as many writing courses as I could. Um, you know, my parents didn't encourage me, but they didn't discourage me. And maybe that was the best way it could be handled, you know, I, and, and so I felt free. I felt free. And, and that's a, um, if you're interested in writing, there's no better feeling to have. Right. No. And, and I look at, you know, the degrees, you know, the, the BAMA from the University of North Dakota, the PhD in creative writing, all very impressive. Do you think, Larry, that I mean, you would be where you are today. Just, just say, and, and we we live the same life you've lived, but minus the the education. Do you think you you still could have been the writer you are today without the schooling? Do you think, or do you think the schooling um, was essential to to develop you as 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 a writer? I think the schooling was essential. I'm just not sure how it was essential. Right. I mean, I I I can't think that I I, I can't think of things in particular that I learned in classes that helped me write. I know I did. I, it, it must have happened. But I think what it did was sort of uh, legitimize a, a, a desire and, um, and sort of the stamp of approval from the world that said, uh, hey, it's okay for you to be doing this. Mm. And the further I went in school, the, the more I felt validated in in doing that you know a graduate writing program does that for you and it also gives you some time to write and says here we think it's important for you to concentrate on doing this so it that, that felt great yeah and, and you know I, i'm of the belief that larry i think there's you can always improve in whatever you know 
way of life, you, you know, whether you're a writer or whether you're a director, or actor, or what, what, whatever. I mean, I think everyone can improve. But I think either you're a storyteller or you're not. I feel like you're you're either born with it, even though we mentioned how you mentioned how, you know, it was probably during college where it really started to, you know, develop. Uh, it's of my opinion that people do either are born storytellers or or they're not. Like people can always improve as writers. I, I absolutely believe that. But is that is that too much of a black and white point of view, Larry? Am, am I onto something with? Um, somebody's either born a storyteller or not. Do you, do you feel there's any credence to that? Yes, I do. Uh, but oddly enough, I, um, I don't think of myself as being a particularly good storyteller. Now, when I write, I care about story, and I, I know I'm paying attention to story, um, which probably means greater attention to plot than many uh, contemporary writers um but you know if 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 we were sitting in a coffee shop or something like that and you said hey larry uh tell me a story i i'd be stuck i'd be speechless i just don't it, it for me it is it is something that has to happen during the writing so if i'm uh if if i'm a born storyteller it's a born storyteller who writes stories Mm. That makes sense. No, it does make sense, and I'm going to hop around a little bit because I, I just wanted to, to just read for you a review that I, that somebody wrote about um, "Let Him Go" about you know your your book, and um, one of the readers wrote, uh, "Sometimes you read a book so good that it leaves you breathless and not wanting to come up for air." Uh, Larry, that to me sounds <laughs> sounds like one hell of a storyteller, if you ask me. Uh, but I mean, when you hear something like that, doesn't it? I mean, I get what you're saying about the coffee shop and and. You know, I, I get that. But when you read something like that, I mean, to me, that would provide such, um, not that you need affirmation, but I don't know. I feel like when somebody talks like that, they're coming from a place of passion. And that has to make you feel wonderful as an author. It, it, it does. Yeah, it does. It's, 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 very, it's very gratifying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't, go ahead. I'm sorry, Larry. Oh, uh, and, and humbling, you know, I mean, um, yeah, I I uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to uh, reviews, or maybe I should say I pay too much attention to reviews. Um, you know, it, they're for me they've always been a little like uh, student evaluations. You know, if I get uh, if I have a hundred students and I get ninety nine good evaluations and one bad one, I feel as though uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> you that's focus the, on that's the one the person who found me out. Yeah. <laughs> I get and it. Sure, I fooled him. I fooled him. <laughs> you know, I read where I don't know if this is just while you're writing or if you do this every day. I read where you you try to write a hundred words a day, no less. You push yourself, even if you're not feeling it. I, am I correct, Larry, with what I read? You are correct. That's right. When I was uh, first started uh, teaching full time, uh, it was at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, you know, the kids were little, we were sort of struggling, I had a heavy teaching load, and and I was having trouble um, finding time to write. And and um, and a visiting writer came to campus, and I'm pretty sure it's her, it was Herbert Gold, and he said something like this. He said, 100 words a day. If you write 100 words a day, in a couple of years, you can have a novel. And 100 words... Uh, you can put a hundred words on a postcard <laughs> and suddenly it just seemed possible. You know, I thought, yeah, a hundred, 15 minutes. If I have 15 minutes, I can get my hundred words written. Um, and were there plenty of days I went over a hundred words? Sure there were, but there were, but I don't think I had many days when I ever came up short of that. And, and I'm a slow writer. A hundred words sometimes takes some time for me, and I still hold myself to the hundred words a day. Uh, I'm retired now. I have a little more time for writing. Uh, in recent years, most days I, I exceed a hundred words, but I still make sure that I do my hundred words. And when I say a hundred words, that means on a novel. Um, you know, I might also be working on an essay if I have an assignment, uh, if I have an idea for a poem. I also keep a journal that I write in every day, but. But the rule is at least 100 words a day on uh, what is almost always a novel. 
Yeah, and is that I find that advice perfect because when you were teaching, and for those listening, um, Larry taught at Wisconsin Stevens Point, and I believe Marquette. Um, is that adv- is that advice that you gave to your students as well, Larry, or is that something just that's personal to you? The one hundred words a day. No, I, I was willing to share it with with students. Uh, you know, I'm I um, sometimes it just amazes me that students are able to get as much writing done as they they do. You know, um, they've got a full load and and classes that are so varied. I'm not sure how they carve out the psychic space to do all that. Plus, they're they've got a lot of partying that they've had to do. <laughs> but you know, we I sometimes we would give them a prompt and we'd write uh, a little bit right at the beginning of a class. And a couple times I'd after we'd written for five, 10, 15 minutes, I'd say, okay, now count your words. How many did, did you get? Everybody would get a hundred words. I mean, there were students who in that short span of time would be up around 300 words, you know, now, so they were writing a page in that span of time. I hope that it let them know that it's not quite as daunting as it as it can sometimes seem. Yeah, and it reminds me, Larry, I feel like it's just such wonderful advice. I mean, it reminds me because I, try, I run every day. I, I run between three and five miles every day. And I, and I feel like, you know what? There's days where I just don't feel it. I'm just miserable. But I feel like, you know what? Just drive to where you're going to run because I run through trails. I run in the woods. I say, Drive there, get out of the car, walk, then run. I feel like once you put yourself in a position to do things, which I feel like what is what 100 words is, that you know what? one step leads to another and you find yourself in a position to really become, you know, to really kind of, you know, eventually get really involved in your work. I mean, I, I was just really inspired by that. I really, I really feel like you can apply that again to no matter what you do for, for a living or a hobby or anything. Oh, I, I agree totally. And by the way, I used to be, uh, 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 a runner and, uh, three to five miles was usually my, my daily run, which I was also compulsive about for a while. And, you know, like a couple of years, I never missed a day of running and uh, um, can't do it anymore. Uh, problems with hips and knees and other body parts, but I still still walk. And you're right. You know, sometimes it's, uh, it's what they used to say. The first step is the hardest and just yeah. get out there. And do it. Yeah. Well said. So what, what do you miss most about? I know you said you, were, you retired. Like, what do you miss most about teaching? Uh, what I miss most about teaching is that something something special and unexpected could sometimes happen in the classroom. And that applies to uh, uh, creative writing class, but it also applied to uh, uh, literature classes. Um, you know, some some kind of dynamic among the the people in the classroom, uh, sometimes you can just see the sparks flying that, somebody's idea gives somebody else an idea and pretty soon we're all making discoveries and um yeah i missed that there there's there's nothing like it yeah it's funny that you bring out the unexpected larry have you ever found yourself when you were teaching in a position where, where you were reading um a student's work whether it's you know creative writing or, or otherwise um where you were so blown away by what you're reading that you, you you know this this that this student might have a future in writing do you ever were those part of the unexpected moments? Do you, do you recall moments like that where you, you, you remember having a student that was, and maybe there, there's many students like this, but a student that was just so, uh, such a gifted writer that it just oh, kind of. That, yes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I, I think I could say uh, every semester, uh, virtually every semester, I'd come across at least one student like that. I mean, somebody who really, really had something, and it was so exciting. Uh, and you know what? Very few of them kept with it. Very few of them went on with it. I mean, so it tells you a lot of, says a lot of things. It means that there's more than, it requires more than just talent, um, some kind of commitment. Uh, sometimes the, I've had students who have gone on to write and publish, and they weren't necessarily uh, the most talent, talented, the most brilliant um, and um, but they stayed with it, you know, and and that's uh, what you said earlier. You keep doing something, you get better at it. Yeah, and we we read earlier the um, wonderful comments about what people thought about let him go, and and um, you know that that's obviously a huge compliment. Um, but it's also a huge compliment, I have to believe, Larry, when when a studio or or a producer wants to buy 
your work, whether it be a novel or a short story or what have you, um, that also has to be a huge compliment. What does that feel like on your end when somebody approaches you about, you know, wanting to make your book into a movie? Is that, is it overwhelming? Does it blow you away? I mean, especially the first time I would imagine it, it's kind of, it, it must have caught you off guard. Not that you're not talented enough, but anybody who writes must have been, must be blown away by that type of, um, uh, I want to say offer or, or suggestion to make a book into a movie. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, uh, it. Uh, the first time it happened was with Montana, 1948. Um, it, it was totally unexpected. When that novel was published, um, it was my second novel. I hadn't published a book for 13 years, and I was afraid it just wasn't going to happen again. Um, so everything that happened with that novel was totally unexpected, a total surprise. And one of the things that I realized with that book was that when your book is mentioned in the same sentence as the word movie, hmm. good things happen to your book, uh, for better or for worse, we're, we are live in a culture where movies still, I think they still rule, you know, and um, um, so very gratifying, um, you know, and then over the years, other novels had, were optioned. Montana 1948 came close, but nothing ever happened with it. Um, and so by the t- time uh, Tom Bazooka called me about Let Him Go, wanted to talk about that book, um, you know, I can't say I was jaded, but I suppose I thought, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll believe it when I see it. Um, <laughs> Um, but we just had a great conversation about the book very early on. Uh, you know, I just had uh, uh, so much respect for his his talent <clears throat> and his vision, and um, and he got it done. Uh, for those listening, um, Larry's talk. Tom Bazooka is the screenwriter uh, for for Let Him Go. Uh, Larry, have you had a chance to see the movie yet? Yes, I have multiple times. Have you? Uh, uh, yes, I saw. So this is where I'm going with this. So I I. I do things backwards, Larry. I watch the movie, then I read the book. Most people have it in the other way around. So I have your book. Uh, it arrived yesterday from Amazon, so I have the book. And I, I anyways, I'm, I'm going to get into this. In a, but there's a couple things I wanted to ask you right off the bat, right? Sure. So we talked about the process and how it unfolds. Um, how close is your rapport with, with Tom um, in, in getting the, the screenplay a, adapted? Um, is, is it one of those things where it's mostly on him is it a collaborative effort does he call you once in a while for you know um what you think because i've talked to authors where it's completely on the screenwriter where it's kind of a collaborative effort how was the situation for you larry uh it it, the that movie is uh that movie is tom bazooka's uh he wrote the screenplay he directed it he was one of the producers um it's it's his uh, we had some conversations early on and throughout the process, um, but it wasn't as though I was suggesting things for him to do. They were, he, you know, he just let sort of let me know where things were in the process. But from the very first, I realized that we shared an understanding about characters, about the direction of the story, about motivations. Um, yeah, and I just uh, um, I, I trusted that he would be true to his vision, and that uh, I, I hoped that something good would come of it, and I think it sure did. Yeah, and I have to tell you, I loved it. And it's just, let him go is a special movie for me for a couple of reasons. One, it was my first trip to the theaters in almost a year, and I used to go every Saturday for twenty years. It was my cathedral, and and, and, I, and I swear I'm not sounding over the top here, Larry. It is where I went every Saturday to find, I mean, it was my place of, of, of just where I could just, just be with myself in the movie. Um, and, and it was my first trip back to the theater in a year and I couldn't have, have come back to a better movie. I was just so blown away. And then these characters, um, yeah, it, it's safe to say I was in tears by the end of the movie. That's, that's a safe bet, Larry. Oh, that's, a, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Uh, um, we we have not seen it in the movie theater. We're not going to theaters, uh, so we've seen it um, 
at home. And uh, so I envy you a bit. There's nothing quite like being there. Something happens in the room. Yeah, and it, it, it just seems, but you know, Larry, and, and I struggled with it too because I have, I have a, and one of the reasons why I'm running now in trails and things is that I cannot go to the gym because of obvious reasons. The virus is just, you know, that's just a petri dish of, of, of germs to go to a gym. And, and, you know, the movie theater was like that too. And I finally said to myself, you know, I reached out to the theater for a screener and, you know, I said, you know what, I'm just going to go. Um, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to do all the right things. And th- the last movie I saw in a theater was almost a year to the day. It was a beautiful day in the neighborhood with, with Tom Hanks playing Mr. Rogers. So there couldn't have been, you know, um, but, but the way I came back to this movie, I was just so, so fortunate because I came back to something that was such a loving movie, such a beautiful movie. Um, yeah, I, I'm just fortunate, Larry. Um, Larry, are you very protective of the characters? Um, and, and I know um, Tom was great and, and I get that. But are you protect even 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 that being said, are you protective of George? Are you protective of of Margaret? Are you and and I hate sounding over the top like this, but I got to believe you. There's there's a love there for these characters. Sure, there is. Uh, but but no, I'm not. Um, I I I was when I was writing the book. I cared about my characters, but um, well. He, uh, Here's something that's just generally true of me and and uh, my relationship with my writing. Once I finish a work, it goes away pretty fast. You know, if if I'm working on a novel for three years, I can keep, uh, I I can keep it in my head for three years. But once I finish it, it goes away pretty quickly. The the file gets deleted. So when I watched that movie, I was watching it the way you were, uh, uh, the way a, a member of the audience does I didn't feel at all proprietary about it um, it um, I did my thing and then uh, Tom bazooka did his yeah and that makes sense um is there something that when you watch the movie you said you watched multiple times Larry is there something that you saw that Tom did with, with the with the screenplay that really blew you away right because you have your story written but you know Tom has his version of it which is of course the movie. But is there something or some things that he did where you were like, wow, that's that's a nice touch. I, I, I like that. I, I like what he did there. Yeah. Uh, oh, the, there, there are so many. And and uh, some of them are are in the screenplay are uh, his words on the page. Um, but many of them are things that he did with with the camera. Um, and if I'm reluctant to say any particular lines, it might be because <laughs> it might be a line that he took from the novel and it's going to sound self-serving or something. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, you know, I hear I have this thing about uh, watching movies or rewatching movies. It's, it's a way that I I calibrate how how good it is or how much I enjoy watching it. It's my, oh, I just want to watch this part. Oh, I'm just going to watch until that one scene. Or, oh, I'm just going to watch to the part where he, and and so when I do that with with Vertigo, no matter how many times I've seen it, or, or no matter how many times I've seen Hannah and her sisters or The Godfather, um, and pretty soon it turns out I've watched the whole movie because it's just one good scene after another. And I felt that happening when I was watching um, uh, the movie, when I was watching Let Him Go. It just has so many good scenes. And sometimes it can be just a small bit of business in the scene that makes it that makes it especially interesting. I mean, it's 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 um, the filmmakers equivalent of the writer's use of of details, you know. Yeah, and you have to feel so good knowing that it's your work that that laid the foundation for this. You know, um, just a few things on the surface here. I, I have yet to dive into the book, but I'm very fortunate to have it. Um, the the character of Pete, the Native American uh, boy in, in in the movie, um, he has a more expanded role than in the novel. I I feel like, and this is probably ignorant, not having gone through the whole book. Um, is is that the case here, Larry? Is 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 his role much bigger? In, in, in the, in the um, film? Um, his, um, well, 
you know, he gets more space in the novel just because, well, it's a novel and you can dev- devote more space to it. Right. But his function is, I would say, as character is uh, very similar in both. Right, right, okay, and because I, I was—that's one thing I had to ask you right off the bat. And when you when you picture characters in your mind, to hear that Diane Lane and Kevin Costner are playing George and Margaret, um, that also, as a writer, has to make you feel like, boy, they, boy, that if that's not—I mean, granted, forget the the A list names, just the the ability and, and the look and the feel that they gave the the, the flavor, quote unquote, flavor that they gave these characters was absolutely breathtaking, Larry. Uh, I agree, and and uh, one of the things that that Tom Bazooka was kind enough to do was sort of keep me uh, posted on on um, how the casting was going, and so Diane Lane was signed earlier, and I was just I was thrilled. Uh, my wife and I like her work so much, and then Kevin Costner, perfect, um, and. My wife and I are big fans of Leslie Manville. I mean, we'll watch just about anything because she's in it. And when I heard that she would be Blanche, I thought, okay. Uh, but I thought she was terrific. I thought she was just terrific. You just stole my next I was going to tell you, her performance was absolutely frightening. And I mean that in every, the best sense of the word. Like, she, I felt it was, I felt if we still had Academy Awards, which I don't think we will this year, that this was an Academy Award winning performance from Leslie. I mean, I thought her performance as, as as Blanche was. I don't think I've ever been so scared of a character, Larry. I mean, like you you see her, and that the more time that goes by, boy, does she make this character her own. It's just such a wonderfully played character, Larry. Yeah, I I, I agree absolutely. You know, um, it, there's a scene in this movie where, you know, I think every community, Larry, has their own wee boys, right? It, the, the, the people that, you know, have nothing to lose, which makes them completely dangerous. Um, with with her performance and, and, and with, with the wee boys in general, um, do you feel like there was a scene in the movie where I, there's a hatchet involved? I feel like those watching the movie start to realize that the wee boys go from being all talk and just frightening to very, very real and very, very frightening people, um, the most frightening kind of people. Yep, yep, you're right. Uh, and, and, and she brings the hatchet. Um, so, and I think you're right. I think they're, they're the people that stories are told about them, and you believe them, and yet you think, oh, man, could that really be true? But when she reaches into the bag and pulls out the hatchet, yeah, suddenly you know everything they've been saying about the wee boys. It's true. Yeah, and, they're, and, you're, and you're thinking to yourself, no, there's just not going to happen. And, and they did a wonderful job in the film of really making that moment last. And, and a couple seconds felt like minutes because you're like, no, this isn't going to happen. And when it does, it almost just like takes you back because – you know, usually we see Kevin Costner on screen in a Western, whether it's open range or unfor- he's been in so many. Um, y- you see him as the guy that's mowing people down by the dozens. But here he's much more vulnerable. George is much more vulnerable. And that's that's what I love most, Larry, about what he did for George. I, uh, I agree with you. I, I um, Twice, twice George has his gun taken away from him in, in the m- movie. And... Um, and, and all credit to Kevin Costner. I'm I'm betting if he wanted to, he could have said no, no. I, yeah, one of my characters doesn't have the gun taken away from him. No, he was he was uh, vulnerable, and I thought in his performance um, was borne out something that that Tom Bazooka and I talked about very early on, and we agreed on. And when he said it, I knew he was the right person to be making the movie. He said. George does it for Margaret. Mm. Yeah, that that is, and, and that's evident throughout the film. And, and it, you know, it's that is so well said. And you, you know, you put yourself in Margaret's shoes. You know, they lose Jimmy, and I have to tell you, Larry, uh, that scene really—it just the way they show Kevin, um, not just Kevin, the way they show George discovering what happened to Jimmy. Um, I, that was a. I got to tell you, I've been moved to movies a lot. That's one of the more memorable scenes i've seen just the way kevin costner handles that and 
the, the, their approach to that, uh, that scene for me, Larry, is one of the best in the movie. Um, I, I thought it just showed Costner's elegance in the way George was written. I just, one of my favorite scenes in the movie, Larry. Oh, uh, uh, that's so good to hear. Uh, I, yeah, I agree totally. Beginning with that shot that's, the camera is, is, seems to be right on the ground. You know, so you see, you see George Blackledge approaching from the distance and, um, Oh, I love that word you just used, that, that there's an elegance there. I mean, there's something sort of stately and formal about him in that scene and, and in, in others. Yeah, and, and, and Kevin Costner has a way, Larry, of wearing pain on his face. You know, where he's a phenomenal actor with, with whatever he chooses to say. But when, when you see him, when he doesn't speak, that's where Kevin Costner's greatness is really appreciated because you see him and, and you... I think about my reaction. What would I be if I saw my loved one on the ground, you know, on the riverbed? What, what, what would I, or the creek, what, what would I think? What would I be like? And the way you look at his face, you understand it. You get all of it. And and that's just a testament to your writing, a testament to everybody involved in this. That was just a beautiful, beautiful moment. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I have to say, you know, your book, the movie in itself, really bring up a great question. And it's one that, for those listening, if you haven't seen it yet, please see this movie. Let Him Go is phenomenal. Um, the book is why well. I'm excited to get into that. Um, you know, I have to say, the, the whole premise of this is, how far will you go for, for somebody that you love? And that's, and I feel like your book, Larry, doesn't waste words. You get right to the point, and I think that's one of your many gifts as a writer, is that there, when I read books and I, and I feel like, other writers will kind of just use vernacular and, and use things that, you know, they beat around the bush. They're, they're kind of taking us in circles a little bit. I feel like you don't waste words, Larry. You get right to the point, and you're so beautiful with the way you write, and you let the reader come along for the ride. It's like a no-judgment tour. You let the reader come along and make up their mind. How far would you go? And, Larry, I, like again, I'm, I'm embarrassed that it's taking me this long to stumble upon your beautiful work. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, 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 um, I have a fear of boring readers. And um, so one of the things that I don't do is I don't do a lot of exposition because it seems to me that that's where um, readers' eyes might glaze over. So I, I concentrate on, on action and dialogue. Uh, I was very fortunate with this book. It felt as though I'd discovered a, a language matched these characters and the story and and um yeah it, it it's happened for me with other books but it doesn't always happen larry from, from start to finish how long did it take you to complete uh let him go so i'm gonna guess a uh, couple years a couple years you know i'm i'm a, uh i'm a slow writer but when i start a novel i figure, yeah, I'll be at this for a couple of years, and sometimes it's taken me less time, and sometimes a lot more. Um, and, and this is a big spoiler, so if you're listening, you can stop the interview here and, and, and listen to it after you've seen the movie, but Larry, was there ever a version or an option in your mind that George walks away with Margaret in the end? Or was this, or was this always what he was willing to do for Margaret, his sacrifice, his wanting to put his grandchild in a position to live a life where he wasn't abused, where his fo former um, um, daughter-in-law wasn't abused. Was this all about George's sacrifice? Probably, but I don't know when I came on it. Uh, I, I, I don't know the ending when I begin a novel. In fact, I often don't know more than just a, maybe a scene or two ahead. Um, it, I think in the writing at some point, I knew just because it was inevitable, you know, um, that he was going to make that sacrifice. Um, now, one of the ways that the the movie and the novel differ is in that um, scene in the wee boy house uh, toward the end. And uh, well, you'll see when you read the novel. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's yeah, it's different. It's also made me not, I mean, I, I just, it, the way it's just so tense in the way the movie builds, and, and, and I'm so upset, I mean, obviously, Corona's given a lot, the virus has given a lot of people a reason to be up, uh, upset, but um, I don't know, I feel like if things were in a normal 
quote unquote normal movie year that this movie would be receiving rave reviews. And, and I hope for anyone listening to this that if you're contemplating going back to the movies, give this movie a chance. I mean, I and I can't emphasize this enough, Larry, that I, I was really just paranoid about going back. But when I went back, I was so happy that this was the the project that I was that I was fortunate and blessed enough. To, to get a chance to watch I, I i left the theater so the movie is definitely not it's not a happy story it's not a feel-good movie but larry it sure as hell is beautiful i don't think there's anything better you can say about a a, a film than that that it's beautiful My, uh, in one of the trailer, trailers kevin costner says he, he feels it's honest and um yeah i'll go along with that yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And my, my very last question for you, Larry, you're so nice to give me 40 minutes of your time. For those that want to be writers, for those that are contemplating a career in writing, you, you know, you're, you're obviously you're a wonderful author. You've you've done some teaching. Uh, what what advice can you give to those that that want to be writers? What and, and there's so much writing is very complicated. It's like chess. There's so much involved in it. But what one piece of advice can you give to those wanting to to, to either improve themselves or or continue with writing? Outside of the 100 words a day, um, which I think is great advice regardless of what you're doing. Um, what, what advice would you give them, Larry? Well, uh, uh, read and write. Uh, reading will make you a better writer even when you don't know it's happening. And, of course, it's a pleasurable activity in and of itself. And uh, the more you write, the better you will become. It's not as though writing will get any easier. Uh, but you will discover things about the craft and about yourself. Um, through your writing he is the author of Let Him Go and he has opened the door for me to read some of his most wonderful works that I'm so excited to get into his name is Larry Watson Larry thank you so much for being on the podcast today you're very welcome thanks for inviting me I really enjoyed our conversation